Well, uh, welcome everybody to this conversation about George III, and I'm delighted to have with me here uh, Professor Jeremy Black, who I'm sure will be known to many of you as a leading scholar of 18th century Britain and the 18th century world more generally, who's also taken a long interest over the course of his career in George III and his activities, and indeed has now written another biography of George III, which is the first we've had really for about 20 years in terms of a, a book focused on a biographical scale about George III, and is indeed the second biography of George III that Jeremy himself has written. Uh, the last one I think was 2004, was it? Or was it 19? Yes, I think that's right, yeah. yes. So I, I thought one place you could start this conversation is rather rudely to ask him, well, why are you doing him again? <laughs> Well, Arthur, I think that's great. And I think it's actually very important and instructive for all authors to face that question. And all too often, when people look at historiography, the last thing they ever find about is asking the, the author. Can I, well, let me start briefly. When did I come across George III, as it were? I was an undergraduate at Cambridge. I did the special subject on Britain and its relations with Europe from 1783 to 93. So that involved reading the Aspinall um, uh, volumes and being a unusual, peculiar student. I went also to the British Library and read a lot of manuscripts from the period, things like the Keith papers and Grenville papers, which obviously had some George in them. And I was going to do my doctorate on that period and then I was told I couldn't because somebody else was already working on a related subject. So I went back to Walpole instead. And in fact, the other chap never finished, so it was serendipitous. Um, and then, as it were, I rather lost sight of George III. I wrote several articles on the period based on my work on the foreign policy. And then I wrote a big book, one of my biggest, I think, in fact, probably the biggest, on British foreign policy from 1783 to 93, which includes a lot on the role of the king. And that meant I had to do a lot more manuscript work. Um, and I got reinterested in the king. And from that odd time onwards, I thought of writing a biography. Uh, but I wanted to do quite a lot of archival work. So, you know, during the decade that followed, I wrote a lot of books that were essentially non-archival, whilst also taking extensive notes of the archives. And as you say, I then brought out this rather large <laughs> work, which is in the Yale series. Um, so I was left, um, as it were, feeling that I'd done George III, not in the sense that I believed that in any way it was finished as a topic. There are many other scholars that have worked on it and are working on it. You've done this excellent work on bringing forward the, the sources. I think these are very important. But I wasn't sure that I was convinced I had something else to say. And I moved on to other topics. Um, and then about... Uh, well, it would be a year ago, actually, I think, or maybe let's think, what year are we in? 2020, yes. A year ago, in 2019, I was approached out of the blue by Stuart Prophet, a penguin, and he asked me to do George III for it. So anyway, he said, can you do it? And more or less, can you do it in a hurry? And I thought to myself, well, what I would like to do is if I've only got 30,000 words, as opposed to, I think, the 210,000 words of the other one, is to look at him differently. And it's a challenge. And I tend to write books because they're a challenge. That's what interests me most. Um, people sometimes ask me about earning money. I never, ever, ever look at the royalties. I never, ever negotiate about the contracts. I just, my interest is in doing the book. And... Um, so I thought, well, I'll do it. After all, I have written, you know, with, say, newspaper history, more than one book, because after, and same with the Grand Tour, after about 10 years, one tends to feel that it's time to rethink again. So I thought it was time to rethink again, to look at the new material. And not only have you been re releasing new material, but as you know, there's been um, extensive literature on the King's uh, mental health and physical health to suggest a movement away from the porphyria interpretation yeah. and so i thought it was time to have another look and also to see if i could do it in that space and still feel happy with it because if you don't feel happy with it you just simply say well i'm terribly sorry i can't do the book and you know <laughs> that's that um and uh, no so i wrote it they 
they published it, um, I, I feel that I feel reasonably happy with it, actually. I mean, sometimes I write a book and I don't feel happy with them. Uh, this one I feel happy with and quite proud of. I think I'd still like readers who are interested, as many of your uh, listeners will be, to read the larger book, because I think that gives one an opportunity in part to hear more from George, because yeah. there's space for larger quotations. I mean, actually, it's more interesting to hear not what Jeremy has to say about George, but what George has to say or other people about George. Um, but yeah, that's how I got to do it. I mean, I think one of the things that strikes me about it as a topic is that it, it comes and fits and starts, doesn't it? So if you go back to the 1960s, there was this wave of publication, both in terms of overall lives coming from um, Christopher Hibbert and then, uh, of course, the, the John Brooke, which I suppose is the, is the kind of, sort of uh, modern biography in, in, in some ways, and uh, Stanley Ayling. And then really something of a drought, drought after that, isn't there? You, you move until you get to the uh, 1990s when there are a few... Um, new attempts on it and you get the uh, uh, Grace and Ditchfield kind of thematic study of, of, of George's yeah. kingship which I think is a very fine book it is, uh, yeah. it's not there was there's been a long and it's slightly odd that nobody has done it in the interim because particularly as we move towards the anniversaries of the American revolution coming up the next time round because after all that's one of the, the prompts I think to your first well it wasn't it that the, the sense of this was marking his relationship with America but it hasn't come back yet and and it's striking to me that that hasn't taken place because in some ways it feels like it should be his moment i think a lot of the the politics of the late 18th century feel newly relevant at the moment in terms of our own experiences of globalization and of new forms of discussion of politics in the media and so on and these seem to be very resonant with some of the themes of george the third's reign so I wonder what, what if you would say, well, what are they going to be the differences apart from just the scale of your two volumes? What, what, how does George III look different to you now to the way he might have looked back in the uh, early 2000s? I think that's a really good question. I think partly it's also how the author changes and in part gets older. Um, I think that's and maybe a bit more reflective, hopefully for good, not always for good, of course. Um, I think... I mean, in part, having a shorter space, I had to shape it more. It's more focused on the king, whereas I think the bigger book is more the king and his times. Mm. And I think that, I would say, is a, is a significant difference. And if you look at a lot of those Yale volumes, I mean, think, for example, of Nigel Saul's excellent volume on Richard II. They are very much king and his times. And, um, you know, it's very difficult if you're writing on George III and you've got 200,000 words plus not to reflect on the, at some length, on political instability in the 1760s or re changing relations with America. If you've only got 30,000 words, you've got to be much more succinct. Um, well, I think can I just say, on your general point, which you made, which I thought was really interesting one about the troughs and rises, I think the... Partly you can get very good scholarship which isn't directed towards a biography. I'm thinking of Linda Collis' excellent work on George III as the sort of symbol, acting, living symbol of a, of a new form of patriotism resonating around a particular form of monarchy. Now, she easily has the ability, if she wanted to, to write a book. She, you know, she wrote a very good and, um, biography of Namia, um, for example, but she chose to write it in a different form. So partly it's that. And there, I think, you know, in the academic world writing biographies is is not fashionable and I don't imagine you would ever get a grant for doing that uh, I certainly didn't get a grant I didn't even anticipate one so I didn't apply for one for my uh, big book um, I, what surprises me a little more is the lack of the wider public world because in a way you would have thought George III would appeal much more to people who are not like, you know, so for example, Christopher Hibbert, a man of letters, but not yep. an academic. And we know, obviously, Andrew Roberts has got a biography coming out next, next year with Penguins, it'd be a big one. But in the meantime, you're absolutely right. So the interesting question is, why is it that men and women of letters in the, you know, for a period of roughly 30 years, 40 years almost, have ignored the king? And the answer is, I don't know. 
because there, you would have thought it would sell as well as many of the other books that have been offered. I mean, it's partly, isn't it? I think um, some of the people who could have been likely suspects moved on to other members of the royal family. So there was this, like, that extraordinary uh, body of work on the women of the royal family that yes. came out uh, from Flora Fraser and uh, Stella Tilliard and uh, Jan uh, Janet Hadlow and all those, those kind of uh, books that have filled out the family picture. Yes. And, and I suppose if you move in that direction, there's a little bit of George III because he's sort of all to combat for a substantial period of yes. his, his reign, where he, he may look less promising for, for that approach once you've done George himself. But it, it's, it's still very interesting, I think, how that, that we now have to re, redress the, the, the framing of George into this rather more interesting family. Well, I think you're right, Arthur. Also, I mean, you and I are both source space historians i mean people tend to associate me with writing a lot too much some critics would say which is fair enough uh, but actually for much of my career i did archival work and in fact i was the editor of archives for over mm. 15 years the journal of the british records association and you will know that george the third and this may well have put off a lot of people represents an enormous task mm. because there is the massive massive out correspondence and the even greater in correspondence and until you came along and you know produced um you know the the the, the modern re-evaluation of george through made possible through the your you know the, the george third papers i think it's fair to say that people were either trapped in using the printed sources which as i tried to sew in my big book were, were, were not sufficient that there was too much that was missing from them or they would have had the task as you and i have had to do of going round quite a lot of archives now mm. some of them it's just a question of toddling into the british library or the national archives for example for you know the pit chatham papers pit papers but others i mean you know i had to go up to you know to 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 butte for example yes. to say, you know, and, and and you know places like that um so i think it was a considerable task to do and i think that would have put off a lot of people mm. I and mean, i think the the other thing that i think is interesting if you if you look at the the way the biographies have changed over the years is it clearly felt very urgent for a lot of the early biographers? And I've been reading some of the the eight late, well, 1820s volumes on, on George III, which there are quite a few and quite interesting ones in that they're relatively ambitious in, in terms of the, putting the king in his world. Uh, so I'm thinking there of uh, people like William Belsham, who writes an extraordinary dissenting biography of George III, which is remarkable, not least because he publishes every 10 years and so he gets longer and longer, but also he has to change perspective as he goes through that, that period, particularly as a dissenter having very particular views on certain issues. And indeed, at some points has to strike out bits of the book. So my copy has a whole page which has been struck through by the printer because what is said about George III is so unacceptable that at least for that iteration, it has to be expunged and then it reappears uh, 20 years later when it's safer to say such things. I mean, that, that's a very, it, he lives a long time and lives through his own historical era in, in that way, yes. both as an actor and as, um, as someone who could be a reader uh, about it. Well, I think you're right. I mean, there is this point about, you know, this conversation in 1830 when Gray, is worried that uh, British politics may be on the eve of another French, of a revolution like France has experienced. Mm -hmm. And in a way, there is an urgency about British political commentary in the 20s and 30s and 40s, because it appears both need opportunity and for some people fear about a total recasting of Britain's relations with uh, its, it, within itself in terms of politics, within itself in terms of social structure, in terms of relations with Ireland. Um, all of these, I think, are matters of great urgency and that, that in a way, George can be brought in as either ally or enemy warning or um sort of inspiration or all of those in a bit of a mixture and i think that that affects i mean the historians writing in that period tend to be whether whatever they in theory are writing on they're writing about the the, the day the, that day i mean i remember i did three essays years ago on a fascinating man called nares who was regis professor mm, yes, at, yes, Robert uh, nares, yes. 
yes. And, uh, you know, the only Regis professor to elope with the daughter of the Duke of Marlborough and accept being Regis professor because he couldn't get a better job. Which I thought that was a hilarious setup. But anyway, Nares, in his great three volume biography of Burley, which comes out in 1826, begins in his preface by asserting his identity as a Church of England man as he puts it, which wouldn't have meant very much to Burley. But the yeah. point is, it means a lot to his readers. And I suspect that George is, and you know, the work you're doing on biography of that period exemplifies what is more generally true of history of that period, which is that it's very difficult, other than if you're engaged in antiquarianism, to move away from a political context. I wonder if you, if you care to reflect a little bit on um, how George III is, is constructed as a monarch and how that comes through in these uh, accounts. Because I think both of us have found very interesting looking at the records of his education in, in, in different ways. And one of the, the features of the Georgian Papers project is we've had a bit more chance to, to dig into this extraordinary collection called the Georgian Essays, which we're not quite clear whether they're actually essays or what they are, but they're, 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 they're a rather miscellaneous collection. And you get the sense of the construction of the king's governing personality there and obviously Lord Bute is, is one of the key figures in that story but it, he's not the only one and there are these other rather less familiar figures who also have his tutors at different points and I think in a whole series of ways leave their fingerprints all over him as as well and I just wonder what you think about the what the, the George III they built was is is he a Whig in, in terms of the way he's educated it, it, as a fundamental identity, or is he, as so many people used to believe for so long, a Tory that's been built in, in a kind of Tory workshop, partly with a background of things like Bolingbroke lurking somewhere uh, in, 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 the, in the dim, distant past. So what, what, where do you think, this, what's the construction version of George III as a political figure? Well, that's excellent. Can I first pay tribute? I could, I'm going to try and answer that if I can, but can I first pay tribute both to the work that your project is doing on those essays and to three other people who I think have, been an in, have played an important role. One, John Bullion, who yes, absolutely. has played and who I was once fortunate enough to stay, a, to stay a weekend with in Missouri in 1988. I think a really nice man, still alive, I'm glad to say. Um, I think Jonathan Clark's work on Waldegrave was mm. very important. And I think David Armitage is doing important work at the moment. So it's not that I've got something to say, which, as it were, is going to um, upset pe people. But if I I can just comment briefly on what what that question entails first of all i sometimes think and i know you think as well that our idea of Whig and tory is sometimes overly structured that there is within both the, within both Whigdom, Whiggery and Toryism, there is a whole host, they're, they're coalition parties in effect, or tendencies, uh, more so than modern day, because of course they don't have party memberships or party leaders, and that in part they reflect the flux of ideas and tendencies going back to the global, well, beyond the Glorious Revolution, but particularly kick-started by the Glorious Revolution. So, I mean, if you were asking specifically about what my views are and how George III was brought up, I think that a lot of it really reflects Prince Frederick. I think it reflects the ideas that he was quite capable. I mean, he'd spent um, a considerable period of time thinking about things, being exposed to things, in a sense getting resentful towards his father and his father's ministers. He'd been quite an active political figure in the run-up to the 41 general election. And I think Prince Frederick took seriously this idea that one needed to have a, um, as it were, a country party breakdown of the old uh, old uh, supposed or real like a dichotomy of opposition Whig and Tory so I think in many senses that is what he's trying to do but I think the key point here is it is a Hanoverian Toryism we could debate till the cows came came home the sort of Evelyn Cruikshank position mm. on Jacobitism but I think by the time you're looking at the late 1740s, early 1750s, Jacobite sentiment, Jacobite significance is much more remote and marginal than was the case if you want to look at it in the 20s and you can take your own view on how strong or otherwise it was then. 
Now, in that context, with Jacobitism becoming weaker, you have the possibility of presenting a country party tradition that's more clearly Whiggish, or if you like, alternative Whiggish. And one of the ways I would put George III um, in some of his respects there, I'll come to his Toryism in a second, but in some respects there, is very much his attitude towards the um, the legitimacy of the Hanoverian rule as opposed to that of the Stuart rule and his view which he takes on a number of occasions that he feels that um, he is uh, king by as a result of parliamentary decision 1689-1701 that he's not necessarily, in other words, have as dynastic a cave, cave claim as the Stuarts. Um, you know, his, when he goes to Gloucester Cathedral and reflects on Edward II, of course, and how Edward II had been, as it were, a, a bad king justifiably removed, when the king comments on Gustavus III's revolution in Sweden in 1772 and says, well, I wouldn't want to do that. I mean, you know, didn't, dresses it up more than that but I mean that in a sense is what he's talking about so I think from that point of view he's very much a Whig monarch and in that respect actually quite significant in terms of the development of British monarchy where I think it's fairer to think of him in Tory terms is his attitude towards religious matters. Now, I'm not implying by that that there weren't Whigs who were firm Church of England men and women, of course. Um, but I think it's fair to say that the king's almost personal distaste for dissenters, um, and certainly for Unitarians, yeah. um, but I think actually he's not really interested in dissenters, not, um, I think it's quite a strong feature of him, so that I think there's almost this rather curious uh, dichotomy. Now, um, there are many distinguished scholars out there, Bill Gibson, Grayson Ditchfield, Nigel Aston, who would no doubt be able to find other people who bridged that divide. And I know, I think a man called Chamberlain wrote a book on Sussex, yeah. in which he looked at, uh, which, you know, which I read some years ago, at, at firm Whigs who were nevertheless clear uh, in their Toryism and that in their position towards the Church of England. So maybe that's what we're talking about, the problem with the language we use to imply two clear contrasts when so many people were able to bridge them once Jacobitism ceased to be a significant feature. I mean, maybe that's one way to approach it. And maybe another way to approach it is that in part, However much, you know, I mean, we can all spend our time, I, I know I get irritated, one can find this within family, friendship or professional contexts in which one thinks one has a set of views, and one hopes that one's made them, relatively speaking, clear, and then other people say things about you and you think, gosh, how on earth does anybody think that? So alongside whatever George III may have thought, uh, envisaged, there was the response to him. Mm. And there I think, in the 1750s, he's not being portrayed as a Tory. I mean, you know, I think that's quite interesting. And he subsequently gets portrayed by as a Tory by, I mean, obviously in part it's political obloquy, but in part it's people who are genuinely uncertain what to make of him, but they have a limited vocabulary within which to place him. I mean, I think one of the interesting questions about him and the, the church is just how important monarchy is for him in that understanding isn't it that I think he has a sense it's not that he's a, a divine right monarch in any sense at all but that he, he does have this very very strong providentialist understanding of the role of God in shaping political fortunes and in particular that of the British state and of, of the monarchy within that and I think that feeds into all of this and it's deeply historically grounded, I think. So one of the things that most surprised me when I looked at those essays that he, he writes as a, a boy, we don't know how far he chose the topics himself and how far he was being set his own work, but is how many of them are medieval. That it's not all about 1688 or about the Hanoverian period or even the Tudors, but as you were saying, the, the sort of Edward II type of medieval history, looking at the, 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 the faction ridden eras of the Wars of the Roses, and also some of the earlier uh, history in, in, in the Norman period, 
that's it seems he was like directly done like very very briefly i assumed my memory is going not so good because i've been thinking on something else recently or today but am i not correct that one of the reasons that he opposed his brother's um well of course not just one of his brothers but i think he, i think it's henry's here uh, marriage into the non uh, uh, a non-royal background as he's very troubled at the idea that the family should touch off another wars of the roses yes, i think it is and he does have that that sense of and he very much expresses that idea and i mean, think it's very striking for a king discussing this issue and i think it's about 1780 to be referring back to events that had occurred over 300 years in which he shows some considerable knowledge uh, and I, you know i mean i don't want to mention my own books i didn't Item, but as you may know I wrote a book on attitudes to history in the 18th century and in that I was very struck at the idea that modern history by which people seemed to have meant uh, I mean in the case of one person I was reading about it meant it was European history they're talking about anything since 1648 was unacceptable but you were expected to know an earlier period I think it's definitely the case that if you picked up anybody who would cart Old Mixon, of course, who um, uh, Jane Austen read, Goldsmith, um, you know, you would, you would, who Jane Austen had, Jane Austen's father had a copy of, of, of Goldsmith, um, History of England, I mean, um, you know, people are still writing large amounts. I mean, in, in the periods we're talking about, Wesley, of course, writes a history of England. Um, um, I'm just trying to think, well, obviously Hume, I mean, it just, I mean, who doesn't is almost yes, a competition. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and given that that's the case, I think, and given that the King was interested in books, um, I think it's not surprising that he really had that kind of kept alive, that kind of memory for him. Of course, that, that, that's the other place where the, the, the Regency crisis fits into that as well, isn't there? Some of those, the, the, the historical precedents that feed into that are very much from that, that sort of era as well. And um, also the Americans. I mean, you mentioned you have American listeners. Um, I, I think it's very important that within the uh, Anglo, Anglo, you know, Anglo-American historical writing of the period, a often highly virtuous episode that is established is the Dutch Revolt. Mm. And I think for a number of Americans, the idea of creating a newly independent federal state. I mean, obviously, there's an earlier example with the Swiss, with Swiss, with the Swiss. But it, but I think the Dutch revolt is the one that really ca comes to mind because it's also Protestant. Um, I think that's very, very important. So, you know, I, I think people are referring backwards, not simply because they're conservative, some do in that respect, but also because actually the past provides a series of radical ideas mm. or radical notions including those of circumscribing royal authority. One rather particular interest, inc incident of that I think is this question of the proposed abdication. Oh, yes. George III on a number of occasions clearly seems to be contemplating walking away uh, from his responsibilities and that's always struck me slightly more puzzling than people seem to notice given given just what a strong view he has of the responsibilities of monarchy and, and the, the extent to which he can be weighed down by that and also his providentialist reading of it quite how he manages you can just sort of leave and particularly if you're going to leave it in the hands of george the fourth which is not necessarily the best pair of hands that you you might be thinking of leaving it in where he gets the idea that he could abdicate Yes, that's interesting because you're absolutely right. Most examples of abdication were pretty dire. I mean, you can think of Mary, Queen of Scots, for example, not exactly a great example. In the 18th century, Victor Amadeus II of Savoy Piedmont had abdicated in 1730, then tries to come back and his son locks him up. Um, Philip the uh, Philip V of Spain abdicates and then comes back when his son dies of smallpox, but creating considerable uncertainty as to whether this is constitutionally appropriate. So I agree with you. I think that um, it's peculiar. Um, I think it reflects a mixture of personal despair, 
a kind of um, wondering whether God has rejected me kind of feeling, um, a sense of the equivalent of somebody who, when you despair, sort of threatens in a way to go and commit suicide. I mean, this is the political equivalent of going to commit suicide. Um, although it's worth bearing in mind that, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it would have left all sorts of mess in terms of the relationship between Britain and Hanover. But it is worth bearing in mind that George I and George II had considered splitting Britain and Hanover. So possibly an outcome would have been one branch of George's, you know, he, had, he wasn't short of sons, <laughs> one, one branch running Britain and one branch running Hanover. Again, very unclear as to what he meant and what he intended. Um, I think what's surprising is how much he lost his grip at those moments, but which does show, you know, the capacity for doubt. I mean, it is his politically, it's his most serious, gravest crisis, because whereas the Regency crisis is a very serious one, um, he himself was not, as it were, mentally and mentally and physically responsible, whereas the country's crises like potential invasion in 1779 or 1805 are ones that find him rising to the occasion. Uh, these are opportunities in which he can't rise to the occasion, but at the same time, you know, 1782, people are being expected to risk their life for him in the armed forces. Mm. So it must have been very perplexing to him. But I mean, the interesting thing is he writes himself very quickly. Mm. You know, he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't have, it doesn't trigger the kind of personal crisis of mental or physical instability that you're to see in 1788 and then to see uh, subsequently in the 1800s with greater frequency. And that I think is interesting. I mean, I think it, it would really have been a puzzle as to what would have happened if it had triggered a, a mental crisis of a more sustained character, but it doesn't. Um, and I mean, I, I was perplexed by the abdications. I mean, I, I'm quite a sort of manic personality who goes up and down all over the place. And, you know, one can understand somebody responding by letting off steam. But this seemed to me to be more than letting off steam. He'd clearly actually considered it. You can imagine him walking round the Great Park angry saying damn these people aren't going to abdicate um, and you know in a way he was a mature man he'd been king for over two decades yeah. he should have been able to rise better to that challenge you would have thought that, that speaks a bit to your view of the uh, issue of George's mental illness and how we should now see that and obviously you, you come out very clearly as a skeptic about the, the pure porphyria uh, my wife's told me off about that i ought to tell you my wife's a psycho geriatrician you know uh, former i think secretary of the royal college but you know she's was a clinician practicing in that area and she said to me well she said i i in other words she have dealt with people with porphyria i've diagnosed them how can all these historians who, who've never met anybody with porphyria uh, comment on them and i was cautious enough not to make any comment on that point i mean um I, yes, I, I think, I mean, in that, I think I went with the recent literature on the subject, and I, and I think that, you know, I read it, it seemed to me measured and thoughtful, and um, it seemed to me to be able to offer an interpretation which fitted the evidence as I understood it. Um, now, it's entirely possible i don't know i have no idea that in you know when you've seen what things has ha have been done over the years with genomes it's entirely possible that in the future somebody may be able to offer a fuller uh, investigation in that fashion um i mean what i would say is that the striking thing about the king is how healthy he was for most of his life yes. and how physically fit and I'm obviously interested in how people compare with other, you know, with other, other families of the period, other ruling, ruling families of the period. And, you know, some of the others last a while, um, but very few people have got that kind of physically fit track record. I mean, he doesn't become ill 
until he's 50, which mm. is, you know, a very good innings. Um, you know, he has a bit of a cold at one stage in the 1760s, but, you know, he doesn't really become ill. And thereafter, I think I'm right, it's 1801, 1804, and then, you know, the final cumulative yeah. break. Well, it's not bad. I mm. mean, it's really not bad. Um, and he's able to go on writing his letters till about 1805. He um, is... Um, those who meet him feel that uh, they can have a serious conversation with him. And um, I mean, of his other, of the other monarchs of his lifetime, I mean, Charles III of Spain is a very impressive figure, but his son, Charles IV, quite frankly, isn't. Um, I wouldn't myself, I mean, I know there have been a number of good biographies, Hartman, for example, Price have written well on Louis the Sixteenth, but I don't think it's possible to, you know, have that positive a view of Louis the Sixteenth. Um, Catherine the Great, in a very different context, is an affected monarch, but I doubt that she had the capacity, you know, as somebody that also ironically came from a minor German royal family, um, so princely family, I don't think she would have had the capacity to deal with the difficulties facing George III. So I think one can draw attention to his deficiencies, and I think mental and physical, or well, particularly mental health becomes one. Uh, and that might be, as Sarah, as my wife said, you know, what we really might well be talking about is the presentation in mental form of physical illness. And, mm. uh, and as you will know, that's the difference between psychology and psychiatry, that psychiatrists are doctors, so they're more apt to look for a physical ailment rather than to look for a behavioural ailment. Uh, or certainly in the British, and this is for the benefit of Americans here, certainly in the British tradition. Um, but the, um, you know, I think on the whole, George rises to the challenge, which then makes his failures when they occur, more, you know, over America, over Catholic emancipation, and, you know, over relations with some, quite a lot of members of his family. Um, in a way, you can't blame those on some kind of gene pool of it, uh, which is affecting him. They're really, I think, failures of attitude and judgment, which we all have. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't have caused similar chaos and difficulty, but I think, you know, he does, he did have choices and he doesn't always make the right ones. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in um, one aspect of the, the uh, mental illness story, which is the, the way in which we've, we've not really spent much time as historians looking at the final phase of that and, and we might say well with good reason because he's so severely incapacitated mentally and physically towards the end of his life that it, it's, it's more difficult to make sense of but on the other hand there's quite a lot of interesting material describing what the mad George thinks he's doing yes <laughs> in those last five to ten years in terms of what he does when he's hallucinating what he hallucinates about and the most striking thing to me you in those is the extent to which Hanover figures very prominently in, in his 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 play acting or his understanding of what he could do his, his interest in going to Hanover to marry Lady Pembroke and so on there's a, a, a yeah. kind of scheme that he spends quite a lot of time thinking about and I wonder what if anything that tells us about Hanover and George III because we, it, it clearly offers a very occupies a very particular space in his mental frame without yes. actually being somewhere where he feels a need to go. Yes, I mean, again, can I yep. mention one of my books, The Hanoverian's History of a Dynasty, mm. in which I try and do all of them. And of course, the point there is of the four Georges, I'm not talking, um, he is the one that doesn't go to Hanover, because George IV does go to Hanover, mm. not, not generally associated with that, but he mm. does go, uh, visiting, incidentally, the battlefield of Waterloo on the trip. Um, Yes, I mean, as you will know, um, we can look at this in two different ways. Um, there was a reinterpretation from the 70s onwards, which drew attention to the role of Hanover, and a number of good pieces were written on that, a piece by Tim Blanding, an essay in the Historical Journal on the First and Bund, a number of good pieces, and I think it's fair to say that you can see that interpretation as a theme in some of the working on um, 
18th on the 18th century British monarchy. And it would be, I think, naive and foolish to deny that. I'm not convinced that at times it hasn't been pushed too far. You know, I mean, obviously, it's always a matter of nuance. Um, as you correctly say, George III never went there. Now, there's a whole host of reasons you can find to explain that. Um, George II wouldn't let him go abroad to serve in the military. Um, he marries young, he starts having children, he starts having political crises. Uh, there's a whole host of reasons that you can draw uh, draw, as a, draw as factors. Um, but nevertheless, it is very striking that he doesn't go. And although there are newspaper rumours, there's never very much to them. And one of the things that's very instructive is if you read through general governmental correspondence of the period, um, you don't get ministers saying, oh my God, the king is determined to go to Hanover, we're going to have to talk him out of this. Whereas, for example, if you look at the 1730s, 40s and 50s, ministers are endlessly talking about how to persuade George II not to go this year. You know, let's tell him he can go next year, this sort of thing. Um, so, I, I mean, I, you know, I did think, I mean, you know, the, I did think, and there's a number of good scholars have written about George III and Hanover, and it's clearly important to him. And there is a German chancery in London. He knows German. Uh, he's, you know, the Mecklen his Mecklenburg in-laws come and visit, etc, etc, etc. He reads German, all the rest of it. Um, but nevertheless, at times I feel they over-egg it. Let's just put it like that. I do feel at times they over-egg it and they try and put together absolutely all the evidence to construct this case. I mean, I think the, um, I think in particular, I'm very struck by how little George III is interested in Hanover in the 1760s and 70s. George II had been absolutely determined that Britain should, um, in the Seven Years' War, as part of the peace terms, ensure that Hanover got its long-term territorial requirements, which were quite modest ones, in Hildesheim and Osnabrück. Uh, Osnabrück, which was an alternate bishopric, you know, prod, you know, they wanted that to be permanently part of Hanover, Hildesheim, and other prince bishopric. And what is very interesting, and I've read a lot of the, because um, I've done work on foreign policy, I've read a lot of the, um, uh, as it were, outside diplomatic uh, correspondence, is diplomats saying as soon as G3 comes in, don't worry, he's not going to cause a fuss. He's not that interested in territorial gains for Hanover at all. And in fact, you could argue that's an aspect of his constitutionalism. That is an aspect of something he's learned from Prince Frederick. And that is part of the reaction against George II. Now, I think it's certainly true that in the late 1780s, the king becomes more concerned about Hanover. I think that is true. Um, and um, uh, Prince Vorontsov, the Russian ambassador, a very clever man, um, very close to the Whigs, so he takes on board Whig ideas, but a clever man has this idea, uh, which I've discussed in some of my work, that there is a kind of nexus running British foreign policy in which Hanoverian concerns, as understood by the king, and that's a crucial thing, that's not always what, as understood by ministers in Hanover, are driving British foreign policy. But it's instructive that that's a view that is relatively new. I'm not saying nobody's ever taken it before. There have been one or two instances in which people have suggested that before, but really not enough to provide a pattern. That's a sort of new view of the late 1780s. So it may well be that there is something real there to, uh, to focus on. It may well be that this, in fact, are people putting together what the king would always be interested in. It is part of his dominions. Yes, he doesn't have a personal link because he's never been there emotionally, but nevertheless, he's, you know, he's a good king. He's concerned about them. And therefore, uh, you know, he is, and he's no longer, I think, really worried as he was worried in the 1760s of accused of Hanoverianizing. Mm. Uh, so interestingly enough, 
and a, a good example of the way in which one has to be very careful about exaggerating the Hanoverian uh, in, influence is in the 1760s and indeed 70s when people wished to criticize the king with reference to his loyalty to a supposed geographical area what they pick is another area he'd never been to which is Scotland so yeah. either through Butte or, for example, um, in the late 1770s, people through, you know, Murray, Stormont, you know, the, you know, that, um, and it's, and I, I think that's interesting, but I think you're right. The 18 teens, Hanover is also of interest. I mean, it's, of course, when the Hanoverian uh, electorate becomes the fourth largest German state in the Congress of Vienna, it becomes a kingdom. Um, and... Um, there's an awareness of how Hanoverian troops, King's German Legion, have fought, you know, well on behalf of Britain. Um, I mean, some others have fought for Napoleon, but that's another issue. Um, I think at that stage, yes, I think you could point to an interest in Hanover, uh, but I wouldn't push it as far as some others have done. And can I just say, I mean, I thought... Um, you know, it's not my business to make any critical remarks, but if you take this George the Third, it comes in the same series. I mean, Stella Tilliard's George the Fourth is out. I thought that was a very interesting book. Um, I thought she had some very interesting things to say about the personality of George the Fourth and his background. And um, I was less happy, I have to tell you, with Tim Blanning's George the First. I don't think he captures very well the interaction of the king and British politics. And it is a series, yes, you might say it's a series about individuals, but it's also sold as the Penguin Monarchs series. George I was monarch of Britain. And I have to say, I didn't, you know, I wasn't convinced that it really captured the extent to which George, you know, it presents George I as a very lucky monarch. I think there are different ways of looking at somebody who faced a rebellion in 1715 to 16, a serious conspiracy in the early 1720s, in which he, uh, much of the army had to be deployed in Hyde Park, the meltdown of the finance system, a war panic at the end. I, I, I don't, I do, you know, the breakdown and collapse of his favourite ministry, the Stanhope Sunderland Ministry. I actually would say that George I was a singularly unsuccessful monarch um, and to that extent what's interesting is that George III is able to create eventually an effective political system uh, under Lord North um, that obviously lasts despite the increasing crisis of unsuccessful and at the very least intractable war lasts over a decade. Then there is this terrible crisis, which, as you correctly say, leads him to threaten to abdicate. But at the end of that, I mean, he is the one who, if you read the correspondence with Pitt in the National Archives, Pitt the Younger, it's George III who is the one who is firmer in that crisis in 83, 84 than, than the minister. I didn't say that because I could only cover so much. You know, and there's obviously one of the great things about discussions like this is it can bring out things that one hasn't always had time to cover. But I think George III emerges as the person who is stiffening his minister, yeah. you know. So, and then, of course, he reaches this modus vivendi, which is quite interesting. I mean, he is willing to drop ministers who Pitt doesn't like, most obviously Thurlow, but equally, if Pitt pushes a policy he doesn't want, parliamentary reform in 1785, the king tends to get his way. And what's fascinating is that breaks down in the late 1790s. And that again is a failure. But, you know, let's be clear about this. That system has worked for over a decade and a half. And most of us living through the chaos at the moment, and I don't know when this is going to go out, but at the moment, I think it's fair to say that British government and politics has been shown in the COVID crisis and the Brexit crisis to emerge in a distinctly poor and uh, unsuccessful light. I think given that that is the case, I think possibly we might be a little bit more charitable <laughs> on the frequency of crises in the late 18th century. I put, put you on to two issues, which I know, there are lots of things we could obviously talk about, but uh, perhaps which I think are, are worth pausing on. So one is um, looking back at the historiography of the last 
20 years, that, that there's been very striking focus on the women of the royal family, uh, from Charlotte, but also the daughters, and the way in which they increasingly feel quite central to understanding some of the politics of, of the, the reign and also the, 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 the individual personality of George III and his response to, to crises. I, I wonder what you, what you think we, we, we most gain from putting the, the, the women of the royal family into the picture in this period. Well, I think that's an excellent question. I mean, I read Flora Fraser's book when it came out, and I once, in fact, met her and talked to her. She's clearly a very sharp and clever person. Um, I didn't say very much about it because I did actually feel she'd done it well, and I did really feel I had nothing else to add. And I don't really like summarising other people's books, which is what I would have had to have done if I'd written about the royal daughters. So you're absolutely right. I didn't say much about those at all. Um, what do I think it does? I think it helps us to understand the king in a domestic context. I think in a domestic context, he appears as um, both what we might regard as attractive and unattractive. You might find that there are attractive attitude aspects of caring and he would see solicitude of calling somebody paternalistic, but you might say they're all authoritarian and misguided disciplinary aspects of being regarded as patriarchal. And I think that again, partly, you know, captures, I mean, one's got to be very careful by analogy here, but partly captures the attitude towards the Americans. I mean, he presents himself as a good but stern father, uh, dealing with badly disobedient children, and the American patriots present him as a cruel and tyrannical father. Um, Do you think he thinks I think dynastically, it, it, though? Sorry? I think he thinks dynastically, so one... One thing that always occurs to me is that the, this, the picture you get of his concern about how the dynasty as a group yes. is, is, is protected in all of this and, and also um, the consequences of the, the marriages and so on that he's particularly keen to prevent happening. I think maybe I, I, I felt well to reading these that you, you saw him as rather more someone who thought in terms of a royal dynasty rather than just... I think you're right. No, I do see in those terms. I mean, I think that... I mean, he, he obviously, the amount of time and frustration he placed in his relations with his brothers and his sons took almost greater time, as far as we can tell, than his daughters. He seems to have, uh, to have accepted, he was quite, in some respects, traditional man, and he seems to have uh, had the idea that the daughters were under the mother, but nevertheless, he does interfere on the marital side and the matrimonial status side and he does so almost um, invariably in a unhelpful fashion mm. uh, i mean it doesn't show him in his best of lights i mean look let me be clear about this uh you know i wrote the biography i hope i haven't fallen into the stockholm syndrome i mean you know which i discussed in the big book i think george the third is very sympathetic i think i mean he's much more wide-ranging than me i mean you know his interest uh, in the in his, in his skill in architectural drawing in his uh skill in playing musical instruments in his uh scientific knowledge um, you know he, he's a wide-ranging man I mean in some respects a highly enlightenment figure and I I think that's very interesting and very important but in other respects I find um, that there is a degree there at times of um, he times he takes his own virtue and, emerg emer and thinks that that justifies his position without sufficient consideration that others might have differing viewpoints. I mean, let's just put it like that. And on a personal note, um, somebody who didn't like novels and is living through the great age of English novel writing, I think is, I think that's great pity. I mean, but on the other hand, you know, sponsor of Captain Cook, uh, interested in astronomy, you know, I mean, he's a very, very, very talented man. Um, and the Hamilton, the, the musical, which is clearly how most people today know him, I think presents a, a very um, limited, limited account. And it's very interesting, as you will know, the Royal Collections brought out a number of works, I think Prince Charles wrote, well, I know Prince Charles wrote in preface to one of them, in which um, they talk about George's 
uh, artistic patronage. And, you know, that's quite impressive. I mean, let's face it, a man linked to the foundation of the um, of the Royal Academy, a man who's the patron of um, Benjamin West, you know, I mean, this, this is quite, you know, there, there is quite a lot of significance there, which again is, is impressive. And um, I think it contrasts favorably with some of the continental comparators. If one wants to think of the nearest tendency on the continent, which is slightly earlier and a bit different, uh, but there is a aspect of North German Protestant pietism about mm. George. Now, there are differences because George is much less of the, as it were, Calvinistic puritanical side. But I think that this sense of the work ethic, which is very strong in, 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 in George, the sense of a life of service. I mean, you know, this is a man who is a world away from the Rococo exuberance that surrounded his father, although his father was interested in the idea of service. So that in a way, if you think about a cross between a patriot king and a pietist king, one is almost thinking about some aspects of him. But to go back to the thing about the daughters, I don't think this necessarily made for him being a good father. I suppose the other thing that strikes me the way we, we're coming to George III at the moment is that we're obviously coming up to the American anniversaries again and that sense of how far he now fits into new understandings that we're getting of the Atlantic world in this period and obviously he was greatly interested in uh, exploration and in trade and in uh, the, what you might call the Georgian world I think was very much part of his outlook because he had all those maps and he, and he even if he didn't travel he knew his way around the globe in, in the literal sense that he, he yeah. he's been looking at globes and i wonder quite what we then make of where he stands on some of the issues that now exercise us a lot about slavery and um, aspects of the, the global system as it's emerged in the late 18th century because i think in some ways we, we, we used to have a slightly indulgent view of some of these things where exploration was a was a a, a, a reasonably euphemistic label to attach to some of the stuff that was going on in ways that could be presented almost entirely positively and now it's become much more complicated the stories we need to tell uh, uh, around that aspect of George III's way great and in fact there's surprisingly little in his own writings reflecting on him this given that some of the things he was interested in I think David Amherst is just going to have something to say about this shortly but it it's do, do we is, is he in that sense an enlightened monarch or is he is he is he perhaps rather more limited? Well, I think that's an excellent question. I mean, by the standards of the modern day, and one, bless you, by the way, by the standards of the modern day, and, you know, one, those are not necessarily better or worse, they're just different. By the standards of the modern day, I uh, would not be regarded as enlightened because of attitudes to slavery, attitudes on, on religious equality, as it were. Um, but if one's looking at him in his own period, um, I think, first of all, you've made an exactly pertinent observation which is that slavery either pro or anti is not a key issue for him now that might and must surprise us because obviously it's you know the grim the grim history of slavery is now one that is and of the slave trade is very important I, mean, I think it's worth bearing in mind i mean david's at harvard now i think I, I i think he'll bear me out that that is also true for a lot of actually the american radicals who as it were, opposed to George. They used the language of opposing slavery, just as the British used the language of opposing slavery when thinking about themselves not being French, but without necessarily thinking, or as it were, registering that that also reflected on a large number of African slaves or people of African origins uh, in the New World or being, being taken to the new world. So there is that side to it. Yes, I agree with you. As far as um, um, empire is concerned, um, it's curious, isn't it? Because there is an aspect of, as it were, the maritime empire and George III with his visits to Portsmouth and the fact that he didn't personally, as his pre two predecessors had done, fight in, you know, in, in the military. Um, George III is more maritime than, than than any monarch since James II, um, and 
I think it's fair to say that if you're thinking of the quest to understand longitude or the charting of the waters off North America, or even Cook's voyages, um, there is an aspect there that is scientific patriotic, if you like. Once one thinks of establishing colonies, then the situation from our modern perspective is different. Now, a lot of the establishment of colonies in that period are from decisions taken on the spot. Francis Light at Penang, for example, in 1786. It's not that there's some master plan in Leadenhall Street or in Whitehall in which they say we're going to establish that base. It's very much the man on the spot. But others, it's very different. You know, the establishment on the base in what becomes Australia in 1788. And there I think it's fair to say that the king um, is in accord with a British tradition which I think you can trace back to the so-called patriot tradition, which is the idea that the spreading of British power, and I, you know, I'm not saying that we should think this at the moment, I don't want to be quoted out of context, but this idea that the spreading of British power is a benign reforming process. So when you see British commentators, as they frequently did in the 18th century and into the early 19th century, saying, Isn't it, wouldn't it be a good thing if we kicked the Spaniards out of uh, the Spanish Empire in the New World and we had independent republics there trading with us and you know being more reformed. They're thinking about a kind of empire which is not identical with what people today when they're often talking about empire decry. And I think one of the problems is that often empire is seen as an either or stage and shall we say uh, both its defenders and its critics can be overly simplistic in, or, or uh, agglomerating in what they're talking about. Um, and, and, you know, as, as far as George III is concerned, um, he personally is not, I mean, he's very interested in maritime activity, he's very interested in exploration, but he's not, you know, he's not, for example, somebody that wants to be told, you know, your forces, your majesty have conquered yet another city in India. You know, it's, you know, you know what I mean? Is is it's that's not his central concern. Um, and I think that's an important point. And I think Public culture, I mean, there's a very good piece by Peter Marshall, of course, about public culture in the 1790 92 My, My Saw War. And as with always with Marshall, very thoughtful, very searching piece. Um, I think it's fair to say that although there are some figures who, to use that crude term, are proconsular, Henry Dundas, for example, you know, and obviously Wellesley Senior, I'm not sure I would put George in that group. I wouldn't put him against that group. I mean, he's not somebody who's going to jump up and down when the French National Assembly in 1792 says we support freedom for everybody around the world and say, rah, yes. I mean, he's not, but I mean, I wouldn't put him, he's not somebody that has the a, a Dundas style understanding of the situation. Um, but I think you're right, it is very difficult now to, and it's something that puzzles me because I believe one has to understand the past in its own terms and hopefully in its own language but also you have to make it comprehensible to people today who have to, who have and there's nothing wrong with them today's values and want to have the past explained to them in a way that is explicable and part of I suppose that process of explaining is to say, you know, I'm trying to explain this to you. It doesn't mean I necessarily myself have a view. When I used to lecture, I used to say to my students, a good lecturer, I would hope I'm a good lecturer, would be somebody where you wouldn't have the faintest idea what I think about the subject. I'm trying to offer you a point of view. So I've, I've always taken the view that George III is extraordinarily religious to be understood with providentialism and religion having a sort of direct impact in people's lives. Um, anybody that knows me will not be describing me as somebody who's, you know, 
uh, a, a, a leading member of the religious cadre. So I think that, you know, I think one ought to be able, we ought to be able to move away from uh, all, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to feel that I could understand both sides' points of view about the American Revolution. My own view, personally, if you pushed me into a corner, is to say, well, what a pity they ended up having to fight a war over it, you know. So, but that, so, and that's a critique of both sides, if you like. I understand both sides, but it's not my job to be making a personal reflection. It's my job to try and understand it so that other people can listen and say, well, black bloody idiot he's wrong for the following two reasons and if they say that that's great if I've helped them to think it's through and you know I know I'm using up your time the one thing I would urge people listening to do is not to read my books but to actually look at the source base the source base for George III is tremendous partly thanks to your project um, it's tremendous there's nothing like it for G2 or G1 or for that matter G4 um, or W4. So it's absolutely tremendous. And the handwriting is easy to read. I mean, you know, I mean, um, so think positively. It's a subject in which you can engage with. And for those people who are younger scholars, it strikes me that there are two areas that, I mean, I'm sure there are many areas that not enough has been done on, but there are two areas that strike me in particular. One, I would agree with Arthur's point about the later years, but I'd also go slightly earlier. I think the period of the late 18 teens, the Portland Ministry, for example, there just really hasn't been enough on George and the ministers in that period. So I'd say that. And by that, I mean the broader sense as well. I mean, it, you know, we've got Linda Colley's marvellous work. We want to broaden it out. OK, the king is provide, presented in a sort of badger fashion there. But what is he still doing? That's point. Uh, one and point two, which I'm afraid to say is hard work. I've done it to a certain extent, uh, but there's still lots else to do. The king spoke regularly to foreign envoys. I have found a lot of material in work that I have done, but there is still a lot of work out there to do. So, for example, I would say that it would be really useful if somebody would go through the Russian archives systematically looking for what uh, is said uh, by and about George III and so on and so forth. And I think this is significant and I suspect you would find all sorts of comments, not least about, the, you know, which some of the things we've been talking about did other people pick up that he might be interested in abdicating? Did other people pick up as ideas on his motivation? It doesn't mean they were necessarily right, but what these men, I'm afraid it's a very genderized profession in that period of diplomacy, what these men would have had experience with is understanding other monarchs and also they'd have had entrees at the very highest of level. Some of these en envoys were overly uh, influenced by opposition politicians and therefore spouted a fair amount of nonsense. And we know that because you can look up the intercepts when the, the intercepts ceased to be a very, very good after the uh, early 1760s. But um, other people are really quite perceptive and quite interesting and the one person they will always give you as full an account of as possible is a conversation with the king. Well there's an agenda for everyone to go away and start work on uh, but I think you're right that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's potentially very fruitful uh, research and we, we were increasingly struck as we worked our way through the archive just how often trails led off towards European uh, powers where we didn't have enough immediately to handle. Gabe Paquette did some very interesting work on uh, Spanish envoys uh, as part of his uh, Sons of the American Revolution professorship with us, which uh, I think is coming out now in print. And there's going to be a lot more like that, I think. Um, and I would agree with you, I think looking at some of the European courts and the, what was being reported back there would be, would be genuinely very interesting. But we must stop there, Jeremy. Thank you very much for talking to us for so long. Um, and in the best uh, book book show tradition, I will wave your volume for <laughs> all good bookshops and probably some lots of good bookshops. Um, um, but uh, it, it's a, it's, I think it's a very interesting short introduction to George III and in some ways benefits, I think, from not being as dominated by America as it might have been had it been full length at the moment. I think it, there's, a, there's a sense of perspective that that gives 
to to the life as well which is which is very refreshing in some ways but thank you so much and um uh, we, we we heartily commend your work to others to read and to reflect in the way you suggested so thank you thank you